from KDI. It is our great pleasure to chair this session that will examine uh, the current and the future pros prospects of the global economy, including U.S. economy, Japanese, and Chinese economy. We have an excellent group of speakers who will share their experience and views. In light of the time, let's begin this session. In a keynote speech, Dr. Dennis Snower will discuss the current state and the future prospects of the global economy, overall global economy. Dr. Uh, Snower is the distinguished scholar from Germany, is now the president of a Kiel Institute for the World Economy, and the professor of economics of Christian Elbrecht, University of Kiel. He has written extensively in the areas of labor economics, public policy, and inflation on employment. After the Dr. Snower's keynote speech, we will have a chance to get a more detailed picture of the global economy with our three presenters who will talk about the current economic conditions and challenges facing the US, Japan, and China. I would like to introduce the speakers in the order of presentations. To my right, uh, Dr. Edwin Truman is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute, who held a number of uh, uh, public policy positions at the U.S. Treasury and U.S. Fed, while being a member of various international groups studying economic and financial issues. Our second presenter is Dr. Jianghua Shi, uh, who was also introduced in the first sessions. He is Associate Professor of Economics at Beijing University. And Professor uh, Yukiko Fukagawa is our third presenter. She will discuss the Japan's current strategy, Abenomics, to revive the Japanese economy. She is a professor of political science and economics at Waseda University. She has extensively studied the economic development models of Korea and other East Asian countries. Because of a time constraint again, I would like to ask the presenters that they will have 10 to 15 minutes for their presentations. Questions and comments will be taken uh, at the end of the all presentations to have an efficient time uh, management. Now, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Denison Snower. I'm very pleased and honored to be here, and particularly on this 20th anniversary of this important Institute for Global Economics. <coughs> And uh, the institute of which um, I'm a president, um, the Institute of the World Economy, uh, deals with many of the same problems, and so I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to be very brief. I'll have a few points uh, that I want to get across. Um, the first is uh, probably well known, and that is that uh, globalization has slowed down. I want to talk briefly about whether that is a symptom of some deeper trend. Then I'd like to talk about um, unsustainabilities uh, underlying the, glo the current global economic system, and uh, lastly say a few words about uh, the way forward. There is a, has been a slowdown um, in globalization uh, that has been uh, much um, uh, in the news. Uh, and that should be a concern to us. Um, world trade um, has amplified upturns and downturns. Uh, the financial crisis of 2008-09 um, was transmitted around the world through a precipitous decline in trade. And the coordinated uh, stimulus that followed also was transmitted through a rapid rise in trade. There's been 
a slowdown um, in trade. Originally, after the crisis, it was projected that trade would rise by around 6%. Actually, over the past 18 months, it's grown by only 2%, and that is very serious. And the reason for that is well known. There is um, selective protectionism. Countries seek the benefit of globalization, but selectively restrict um, flows of goods and services, labor and capital. And um, this uh, is also easy to document. Um, exports as a rise. Uh, as a share of world GDP rose steadily from 1986 to 2008, but have been constant since then. Uh, trade liberalization has shifted from multilateral WTO to regional and bilateral deals. In terms of labor um, flows, migration has become more selectively managed. Admissions criteria have been tightened. Uh, and uh, entry um, for scarce, highly skilled workers and entrepreneurs is encouraged, but otherwise the rest is discouraged. Uh, capital flows, um, they exceeded, uh, uh, global capital flows exceeded um, $11 trillion in 2007. They were about a third of that um, last year. <clears throat> Cross-border direct investment has fallen. Banking has become less international, more focused on domestic lending, and uh, ring fencing of foreign units. Um, this is uh, some evidence that underlies uh, rise in implicit protectionism, potentially trade restrictive measures by type um, have been on the rise. International capital flows, as I said, um, are uh, in decline. Foreign direct investment um, has also declined um, after the recent upturn after the financial crisis. Uh, and on a global level, this is particularly apparent. And um, that uh, leads one to ask, um, why is this and is this a symptom of deeper trends? What is happening to global growth? Global growth, as we know, is driven by globalization in part, which is slowing down, technological change and increased factor inputs, um, labor, capital, resources. And waves of globalization have often exploited differences in comparative advantages across countries. So in the immediate post-war period, there were large comparative advantage differences between developed and developing countries to be exploited. Then in the 1990s came the integration of ex-communist countries um, into um, the globalized uh, world. And the question is, um, what do we have now that is driving it? And I'd just like to leave you with a hypothesis. Uh, it's not one that's uh, possible to test at this point because we don't have enough data. But um, the hypothesis is this, that in the mid-1970s, we discovered that there was a productivity slowdown. Uh, in the immediate post-war period, uh, growth was quick. And then all of a sudden, it slowed down after the first uh, oil price uh, um, crisis. And that slowdown, according to the conventional wisdom, lasted until the mid-1990s. And then growth accelerated again. Now, my hypothesis is this. Suppose that there never was an end to the productivity slowdown in advanced uh, industrialized countries. Suppose that once the catch-up after World War II had taken place, the natural rate of growth for most countries was between 1 and 1.5% 1 1 in the advanced industrialized world, and we just didn't see it because this trend was masked by low interest rates and increasing indebtedness. What then? And this would come at a time in which these countries face increasing problems in terms of inequities, intergenerational inequities, 
uh, income inequalities that are very clear in the United States and Great Britain, but manifest themselves more in terms of inequalities in terms of employment probabilities uh, in uh, your many European countries. And there is an increasing inequality between that part of the workforce that is adaptable to changes in new technologies and changes in customer demands and that part of the workforce that is non-adaptable. And so a lower rate of growth, um, which we may be in for not merely, as uh, Dominic Strauss-Kahn has said, uh, for the next few years, um, but perhaps in the longer term, uh, combined with rising inequalities, um, may be an important policy challenge that we face, and it's certainly one that policymakers should take seriously as a possibility, but very few have done so. And this brings me to policy challenges in the, in the form of four unsustainabilities. The first is fiscal unsustainability. And this plagues much of the OECD world. Um, there's lots of data, I don't have it here, but uh, you all know it. Uh, and that is that in bad times, countries should do deficit spending in order to get their economies out of recession. In good times, when tax revenues flow in, there's so much political pressure to spend the money um, that uh, too much is spent, and that is the origin of deficit bias. That over the cycle, um, in the longer run, deficit, uh, deficits and national debt in particular tends to rise relative to GDP in uh, most OECD countries. And that cannot possibly be in the national interest. And uh, this is unsustainable, and we have not found a framework for dealing with this unsustainability. In Europe, we have a fiscal pact um, that uh, no one knows quite uh, how it will be implemented. Um, the United States needs to think seriously about this. And the way to do so, to my mind, is to make fiscal policy more like monetary policy. Monetary policy did well in taming inflation once uh, we had independent central banks with um, inflation targets. And now it seems that given our long experience since the 70s with deficit bias, um, national debt rising relative to GDP in so many countries, it would be useful for countries to specify fiscal rules that, um, and these fiscal rules would specify what the long-term ratio of debt to GDP is. In the European Union, that's 60%. Secondly, it would specify the convergence rate, how quickly you approach this long-term ratio of debt to GDP if you're away from it. And thirdly, how counter-cyclical fiscal policy may be. Obviously, you need fiscal policy to fight recessions. You don't want to rely on monetary policy alone for that. The European Union has um, fallen into a trap there, and uh, countries um, that are uh, deeply indebted and uh, in recession are uh, forced uh, to save, which makes the recession worse and uh, sustains the problem. So it is in good times that most of the saving by governments needs to take place, and it would be useful to have a rule um, that specifies this in advance and independent commissions um, that see how countries are doing with regard to their own rules. So I believe that uh, the issue of fiscal um, sustainability uh, probably needs to be dealt with in terms of rules, and that pertains not only to the European Union, it pertains to many other countries, including the United States. Then there's the problem of financial market insustainability, and um, there, one of the major problems is that we haven't solved the problem of too big to fail. Uh, in fact, it's got worse. 
uh, we have invented the concept of too big to fail. And those are institutions that uh, must be rescued. And um, they obviously have and will always have, by nature, an incentive to privatize the gains and socialize the losses. We need to change the incentive structure of systemically relevant institutions, either eliminate systemically um, uh, relevant uh, institutions or change their incentive structure. And there, I believe, there are proposals on the table, but these proposals have hardly been acted on in the policy world. And one really interesting proposal that has been used in a small number of cases um, are mandatory contingent convertible bonds. And that is that systemically relevant financial institutions should issue debt that automatically converts into equity provided that their capital ratios uh, sink beneath a certain level. And that um, would give the shareholders of these institutions a natural incentive to stop the management from uh, generating excessive risk because if it did so, the danger of dilution of the stock um, would rise enormously. And that is something that uh, ought to be considered uh, on a global level uh, as a way for systemically relevant financial institutions to internalize the externalities that they generate. And then there's the issue of monetary policy on sustainability. It's been raised. Um, the most important issue here is that central banks have a conflict of objectives. They need, on the one hand, they need to stabilize prices, inflation targeting. On the other hand, they need to stabilize financial markets, which is like asset price targeting in the opposite direction. And when inflationary pressures come to bear, and they will sooner or later, then these two targets will come into conflict. So once we are in an inflationary world, central banks will have to make a choice. Do they raise interest rates in order to keep inflation down, but thereby possibly destabilize some uh, uh, financial markets uh, where indebtedness is still very high, or do they simply focus on stabilization of financial markets, in which case we've lost our anchor for inflation expectations, and then we could be back in the bad old world of um, the 60s and 70s with inflation um, out of control. This is an issue that uh, needs to be addressed, and I believe that uh, the future lies in central banks going back to inflation targeting and independent institutions uh, be there to vouchsafe um, financial stability. If both of those are put into the same hands, then there's a clear conflict of objectives that central banks are just unable to avoid. And the last on sustainability, is the unsustainability of growth. I've alluded to this, perhaps growth in advanced economies is lower than we thought. Um, one thing, just by the by, that really needs to be said, in this era of low interest rates that we've had since the crisis, that should have been a time uh, in which governments um, spend a lot on investment, particularly in human capital and very selectively in infrastructure. And the fact that not enough has been done in the advanced um, industrialized countries is something that uh, the history books will be much exercised about. So I believe that um, sustainability of growth is going to be a problem that will be with us for quite a long time. And uh, particularly this sustainability of growth alongside rising inequality is something that will exercise the imaginations of policymakers. And I believe that the way forward there is 
to rethink the nature of redistributive policies. Many redistributive policies simply involve redistributing money from rich to poor. And we should think more in terms of redistributing economic incentives, incentives for employment, incentives for training, from the, um, towards the disadvantaged. And to some degree that's been happening in the 1990s, for example, the OECD championed active labor market policies, and that uh, clearly was uh, to the advantage um, uh, of the OECD at that time. A lot more could be done uh, in that regard, with regard um, not only to employment, but also education and training, health, pensions, uh, the demographic time bomb in many countries um, could be um, avoided by providing um, more incentives uh, to work beyond retirement age um, for uh, people who uh, have, who could be given the appropriate uh, incentives that would be budgetary neutral, and that is to you. Uh, save money, um, the government saves money by having people in the workforce uh, that it would otherwise have to support, and some of this money could be spent on subsidizing their employment. Um, in similar things uh, could be thought of in terms of um, disability and health, and I think the topic of redistributing economic incentives will probably lie at the heart of the future of the welfare state. I know that um, large countries like China, but many emerging market economies are now thinking very deeply about um, how to insulate their populations from major shocks and what their welfare states should look like. I don't think uh, that they should necessarily follow the European um, example, but re redistributing economic incentives so as to create maximum equality of opportunity in terms of employment and training is probably the way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Snower, uh, for the insightful presentations. Indeed, the global economy faces the difficult policy challenges on many fronts, including the fiscal sustainability and the sustained economic growth in the face of a slowdown in globalization and capital flows and world trade. Thank you. Uh, now, I'd like to invite Dr. Truman uh, to uh, our next speaker, to represent the global economy, uh, uh, state and prospects, the U.S. economy. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, a pleasure to be here again in Korea, in particular uh, on the occasion to celebrate the 20 years of uh, success of the uh, IGE. Uh, uh, to some extent, I'm uh, a pinch hitter or also a, a cribber. Uh, I'm not getting up here and saying these remarks are not my responsibility. I'm not, uh, since I'm no longer in the public sector, I don't have to say that. Uh, 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 but I do draw upon the work uh, that has been done by my colleague twice over, David Stockton, uh, who was a colleague at the Federal Reserve and is now a colleague at the Peterson Institute for International Economics for some of uh, what I'll be uh, uh, presenting. Uh, and he presented an outlook. Um, for the U.S. economy uh, earlier uh, earlier this month, and it focuses a little bit more on the short run uh, than on the longer run. Uh, though I'll come to that uh, at the at the end of my uh, remarks, at least uh, at least uh, uh, briefly. So the basic outlook um, uh, is for slow improvement. Uh, Continuing, continuing slow recovery. Uh, it is difficult to say that the U.S. economy is in an expansion phase, uh, but it's certainly in a recovery phase. Uh, we are expecting a pickup in next year, uh, largely because we anticipate that there will be less in the way of a fiscal drag uh, and a tiny bounce back from the effects of the, uh, of the shutdown that we experienced uh, earlier this month. 
there's a long-term uh, trend, downward trend in employment and inflation is largely uh, quiescent. Uh, here you have a, a comparison of the forecasts of Dave Stockton in the first instance, uh, 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 the FOMC, it's, uh, secondly, uh, both uh, uh, where it is today, essentially, and where it was a year ago, uh, and the latest World Economic Outlook and a similar uh, comparison with respect to inflation underlines uh, this point. And I think the, the markdown, the one thing I would point out to you is the markdown in the outlook for the U.S. economy uh, by the FOMC between uh, December of last year and September of this year largely explains why the taper that was uh, promised, hinted at in May, uh, was not uh, implemented uh, in uh, September. And that is yet to be, yet to be seen. This all takes place against a, uh, a global outlook. Uh, this is the sequence of, of WIO forecasts, as been mentioned earlier, including by Dominique Strauss-Kahn. There's been a steady marking down of global forecasts uh, by essentially all parts of the world. Uh, and it does appear, if you look into the sort of medium-term forecasts for the, uh, that are put out by the IMF, uh, that they have marked down. Uh, this uh, relates to Dennis Snowden's uh, comments, uh, uh, Snowers' comments that uh, uh, it looks like global potential growth has been marked down by one percentage point uh, uh, compared to uh, where it was uh, three years ago. Uh, uh, and as far as the U.S. economy is concerned, this means that we're not going to get any help from the uh, external sector. So as far as policies are concerned, as I said, fiscal policy continues to uh, to be uh, restraint continues to be there, but will be at a reduced pace. Monetary policy provides somewhat of an offset, though there will be tapering at due course. And the United States Congress remains in, in fortunate gridlock, which has both short-term and long-term uh, effects. Here, give, here you have a here you have a picture of uh, a fiscal drag. Uh, this is a essentially the net change in the structural deficit. It's a little different than what you find in the IMF's Rio, but what you essentially have is you've had 2%, 4 percentage points of GDP taken off of the U.S. Uh, structural deficit over the last four years. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, it'll be somewhat less uh, in uh, next year. Uh, and it is interesting, uh, in light of various uh, commentaries on this line, including uh, including by uh, Europeans, uh, that in terms of the Toronto commitments to have budget deficits uh, by 2013, the United States uh, is one of only seven G7 countries to, admit, to, have, missed, to have hit that, uh, that commitment. The only other two are Germany, on the one hand, and Italy. So two of the most uh, strident countries in this regard Canada and the UK have missed the, their, their Toronto objectives. It may be wise to have missed them. It may be unwise to have made them, uh, but it is a, it is a fact. Uh, and of course, some of this is related in the United States case to our recent uh, fiscal um, uh, dysfunction. Uh, the government's shutdown could have had various effects on GDP. Uh, it looks like uh, we had roughly a three-week shutdown. That's going to cut. Uh, GDP in the fourth quarter by about a half a percentage point. Remember, we, we do things, everything at an annual rate, so this is pretty one or two tenths at most uh, uh, if you think about fourth quarter to the fourth quarter. We avoided uh, the uh, debt ceiling, though that would have been a much more dramatic uh, uh, drama. Uh, and there is some uh, positive probability that we'll have a repeat engagement in the turn around the turn of the year in the first. Uh, quarter of 2014. That is not, I think, the best to forecast. I think uh, even the, the, the United States Congress is exhausted uh, and uh, does not want to go back, back there again. Uh, so I suspect uh, it is conceivable, small probability, that we'll have a grand bargain in terms of the short-term, medium-term fiscal situation in the United States. Uh, but it's more likely that the Congress will kick the ball down the road uh, to the end of the fiscal year in uh, next, uh, in next, uh, 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 which ends at the end of September of next year. Uh, 
Of course, the important question, which I suspect some people uh, actually have already referred to and, uh, and probably will refer to more before this conference is over, uh, is that whether there is uh, long-run consequences to the fisc the, our fiscal dysfunction. Um, the, it certainly is not positive either for the United States or the world. That's the, thing to the, the, uh, is the uh, starting point of my remarks on this point. Secondly, you are nevertheless already seeing a evolution towards a much more multi-currency financial system. This has been referred to already in the remarks in the previous session. Uh, the events of October this year gave this trend a modest boost, but I would emphasize the, the modest more than the boost. Um, and most of the contemporary uh, complaints about uh, U.S. measured uh, uh, failures were defensive, I think, and devoid of content. They were largely derived, directed at deflecting domestic criticism, uh, uh, which were of choices which were their own. No one is requiring other countries to invest in U.S. dollar assets or U.S. Treasury assets. That's a free, they live in free choice, uh, and that's the situation we have. Um, and a de-Americanized financial world probably will emerge in due course, but it's an open question whether it be an improvement. So quickly, in terms of monetary policy, uh, in due course we will see a tapering. I think the best guess now would be a start in the middle of March. That will mean that you'll get somewhat more than half, one and a half trillion dollars totally. Assets are not going to be sold in the mean term, uh, assuming there's a moderate pace of, uh, of expansion in the meantime. And the federal funds rate will, will eventually turn up. Uh, but this forecast assumes that that won't be before the middle of 2000 and, uh, 2015. Uh, the quantitative easing has had a substantial effect on the US economy. This is uh, one set of estimates of how it's lowered the uh, term structure of interest rates. That's had a variety of uh, effects, most of which were intended. It has led to a, a, uh, a uh, excuse me. Uh, thought I had it in here. I get it out of order. Uh, a boost in housing and an improvement in, uh, and an improvement in, uh, in uh, financial conditions, which has boosted consumer, uh, consumer spending. Uh, it, uh, uh, credit terms have become easier. Uh, steadily, there's been some improvement in uh, business investment, but not, uh, not at the rate that one would have expected or wanted. Uh, uh, but the labor market retain, remains uh, extraordinarily weak. Uh, and the improvement in the unemployment rate masks a, uh, a continuing uh, uh, shortfall in, uh, in the growth problem, uh, payroll employment and uh, low participation rates. So we have a potential problem of, of, uh, of uh, structural unemployment, uh, and that is a reason to be concerned, both because it leads to a deterioration of job skills and weakening attachment to the labor force, uh, and, a, and a consequent a permanent loss in the potential income. Uh, but we have a secular as well as a, uh, as well as a cyclical decline in the labor force participation rate, but as you see, uh, the, secular, the cyclical decline is uh, substantial uh, by at least two per percentage points of the overall population. And lastly, inflation. Inflation remains uh, uh, low uh, relative to the Federal Reserve's target. Indeed, I was interested to read yesterday that a, a writer for a prominent uh, a conservative uh, think tank in Washington says the Federal Reserve should be spending more time worrying about actual deflation. Um, uh, but at the moment, uh, inflation expectations inflation expectations are, are quite stable. Uh, but we do have challenges. To some extent, these challenges mirror uh, Dennis's uh, uh, list, even though I would talk about them differently. We have the federal debt as a share of GDP has risen dramatically. It is projected by the, uh, not the IMF to level off. That obviously is not uh, sufficient uh, because after 2018, there will be a pickup in the debt ratio. Uh, that leaves very, at a minimum, leaves very little room for future uh, maneuvering. Uh, 
because there will be another recession or a slowdown when you would want to use fiscal policy. Uh, and we've largely made the wrong choices by focusing, in fact, our debt reduction too much on the short term and uh, too little on the downturn, which is what uh, most economists would, would want. Then we come to the monetary uh, proposition that uh, situation. Obviously, the Federal Reserve's uh, obviously the Federal Reserve's balance sheet has expanded rapidly. Uh, certainly, that provides some tension for inflation, uh, and the Fed must be vigilant. Um, uh, that could imply a rapid acceleration in interest rates if, in fact, the economy starts to boom. I don't think that's in anybody's forecast. I am not particularly concerned about the kind of concern that Dennis was talking about, uh, about there being a tension between financial stability in that sense and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, price inflation stability. That of all the concerns that I've witnessed over the past 20 years in the Federal Reserve's operation, that has not been the case. It certainly was not what drove us to an overly inflation policy, inflationary policy in the mid-1970s. Uh, um, but uh, it could be political issues if we, in the process of doing all this, we, end, we uh, being in the Federal Reserve, end up taking losses. But the basic problem, and this is the one that, uh, that uh, Dennis uh, closed on, is that there has been a slowdown in the productivity in the United States. Uh, uh, that stresses the need for structural changes uh, here in the United States as well as elsewhere. Uh, I'm not sure I would hold my breath uh, in this regard. Uh, but that said, I am much more optimistic about the United States than most of the rest of the world seems to be. Uh, we have considerable uh, potential. Uh, the very fact that we are a big country and with uh, a, a large and diverse and many dimensions country uh, means that we have uh, more capacity and we live within a monetary union that's been around for 200 years plus years. means we have more capacity to adjust. Uh, we, at least the economists, I think, know what, what should be done. Uh, 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 and it follows that uh, what we will do uh, what needs to be done and will have a positive effect for us and the rest of the world. But that's not to say that the United States is, uh, this is the century for the United States. It certainly is not. Uh, its role will continue to decline, and that is uh, necessary and appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Truman, for the insightful overview of the current economic situations and the policy challenges. Now, uh, let me invite uh, Dr. Xi uh, to present uh, the Chinese economy. In light of the time, uh, I uh, would like to ask Dr. Xi to, be, to present uh, as briefly as possible. Yes. Yes. So I'm going to, in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, China macroeconomy and uh, what has happened in the past 10 years and uh, where we are, what's the, what are the problems, and uh, what's possibly going to happen next. So in the file I prepared, in the first page, I have the GDP growth rate. And the GDP grows from year 2000 to year 2012. Uh, I probably don't, will not refer to that picture a lot, but if you look at that, we have an inverse the V shape. First, like growth a lot, and then decrease. So the growth rate, growth, growth rate in year 2000 is probably something like 7%. In year 2007, at the peak, I think it's uh, second quarter, is 15%. Now, at the second quarter of year 2012, we are looking at 7.5%. So you see the growth rate increase a lot, to 15%, then decrease a lot to 7.5%. Actually, during the past two or three years, a lot of pessimistic opinions about China economy in terms of, say, the sustainability cannot be, the, the growth can, it's not sustainable, the growth rate is already slowed down very quickly. And uh, the structural imbalance, the low consumption share, the, the high investment share, the big, big part of net export, all kind of discussions about that. So, let me briefly explain what happened on that picture. So I think what happened in China, the fast growth from year 2000 to year 2007 uh, and 8, is due to the 
a systematic reform that happened at the end of 1990s. We have three major reforms back then. The first is the discussion to enter the WTO. So China has access to the world, world uh, product market. And export, import, import and export increased a lot after that, especially after year 2002. That's one big uh, push of the economy. So China benefited a lot from this uh, globalization, this round of globalization. Second is the reform in the SOE sector. We have a major round of reform in the SOE sector. A lot of low efficiency SOEs are sold or dismantled. And the primary sector is getting bigger and bigger. So the overall micro level efficiency increased a lot during the past 10 years. That's the second major reform. The third reform is in the housing sector, actually. In 1998, we have a major reform in the housing market. Before that, we do not have a commercial housing market. After that, the people are allowed to develop and sell and buy uh, commercial housing. And that's a big part of the China economy right now, especially during the past five or six years. And that's also uh, uh, the foundation of the real estate boom. So the three reforms improve the economy and uh, give us a uh, very rapid growth from year 2002 and 2008 and 9, uh, last until the global financial crisis and economic crisis. And after that, we have a fast decrease in growth, in, in growth rate from 15% to about 7.5%, which is the ba basis for the pes pessimistic discussions about China economy during the past two or three years. So we have an inward U-shape of in terms of growth rate, and that's what happened. So. The question I want to ask here is how to interpret that figure and what is uh, strange or normal about that. I already said uh, what drives the growth and I also want to discuss that uh, the growth is abnormal in many senses. First, if you compare the growth rate of 12%, 13%, 15% in year 2006 and 2007, it's very strange. If you look at the history of Japan and the Korea, we have also have very high growth rate, something like 10% or 9%. So some, a number close to 10% is not that strange, but if you tell me the growth rate is 15% or 16%, uh, because we have some discussions that GDP growth rate is actually underestimated for some time, then that's very strange. So why the, the rate is so high during that time? My, uh, I think two factors contribute to that factor. The first is uh, ex the exchange, exchange rate. From year 2002, there's a, because of China access to the world uh, capital uh, uh, factor market, there's a lot of improvement in productivity. That's, so the productivity in China increased as some pressure on renminbi exchange rate. If the renminbi exchange rate is, is, okay, is increased, then we do not have that huge amount of next part because the renminbi rate uh, increased only gradually and slowly much, much later since the year 2005. We have a huge amount of next part, especially in years 2006 and 2007. If you look at the picture, there's a huge hump there. That's contribute to the 16 or 17, 15% uh, of growth rate. That's big one, one part of it. Another part of it is the uh, uh, interest rate. If you look at the interest of China during the past about 10 years, the average uh, saving rate on one-year deposits is negative 0.4%. Then uh, the, the one-year loan rate is about 2.8%. If you compare that number to the rate of return on capitals, there's a huge margin there. I have a picture showing that during the past uh, about 14 or 15 years, the capital rate of return increased a lot. Uh, from year 1998 until year 2011. So there's a huge profit opportunity in terms of investment. So investment increased a lot uh, during the past several years, especially in year 2005, 6, 7, and after the uh, crisis. And the share of investment in GDP is something like 50%, around 15%. That's a huge number if you compare that with other economies. But it's reasonable in terms of the rate of return on capital, especially it is further boosted by the low interest rate. So the two parts, the first part lead to next, uh, a huge amount of net exports, the second part lead to a huge amount of investment that boosts up the growth in the early years, around year 2007. And after that, because the exchange rate already adjusts a lot, the exchange rate against US dollars right now is something like 60.1%. So 30 something percent of increase operation already happened. And the uh, real interest during the past uh, two or three years already increased a bit. So those, uh, change in, fun in fundamental factor prices actually lower the growth a lot. So that's the situation we are facing right now. 
you look at the whole picture, you kind of see that the, uh, the first half of the period after year 2000, still some growth from the future because the investment and, and export, the net export already happened earlier, which reduced the amount that is available to do here uh, in the second half, half period. But actually, that's a bad thing for China. That's a bad thing for China because if you do the net export later, do the investment later, you have better quality, you better price, you better welfare. So it's kind of a mismanagement of the macroeconomy. That's where, where, where we are standing right now. So what's next? I have a picture in the paper saying that if you look at the overall economic structure, some change already happens. For example, after the year 2008, the, the, there's a large amount of fiscal stimulus, but the effect is mainly observed in the construction sector, not the manufacturing sector. So that's also accompanied the real, real estate boom in China. So the, uh, also there's a gradual pickup in the service sector. That's because the exchange rate already increased a lot, and the overall structure of the economy already began to balance. And consumption share also stabilized and began to increase. So that's uh, the effect uh, we already began to observe. The next question I want to briefly discuss is where, what the big change we're expecting from here. One thing is that the rural China still lag behind, far behind. If you look at the China macroeconomy, the overall income if, uh, ratio between urban and rural residents is something like 3.3 or 3.2. But if you, if you include the implicit income of rural and the urban residents, then the ratio is something like 5. It's something like, like 5. So if you can increase the rural income, you liberalize the rural market, you liberalize the rural land, you liberalize the rural population, the labor force, there's still a huge space for manufacturing because actually their consumption propensity is still very high. So the way to do that is to, as I said earlier this morning, to melt the rural market into the uh, national, uh, national mar uh, market system. And a fundamental reform in that area is going to be the land tenure reform because right now the rural residents are still kind of bundled to the land. The mobility in land and labor are very low. So that's one key area. If that's going to happen, a rough calculation is going to tell you that, let's say, the, the GDP can, can double or even triple just because of that. And also, if you believe in economics, you believe in market, if you believe in labor specialization and human capital accumulation, the space could be even larger, actually. So that's the first thing. The second thing about that is, if you look at one aftermath of this huge uh, renminbi much, uh, rate uh, depreciation recently, then you have uh, 3.7 trillion dollars of reserves, and uh, most of them are put in low return assets. And then right now, the exchange is much better. Renminbi push forward is much, much bigger. So at standing at 6.1, more people are waiting to use renminbi to change for international assets. So another round of international overseas direct investment is going to happen, probably. And of course, uh, the, the, the basic reason for that is that the price says so. It's going to be more profitable to, in, to do business overseas. So if you look at this, and if you the China and the entrepreneurs or business, they can combine their capital, their organization skills with labor in other less developed countries, and with the raw materials in less developed countries, you can probably see another round of global production reshuffle. The global production capacity could be increased a lot by a huge margin. Then we can see another round of growth. That's something could happen, but of course, nothing is sure for this moment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Xi. Now, uh, I'd like to turn the floor over to our the final speaker. Professor Yukiko Fukagawa. Uh, thank Thanks. you very much for inviting me, and uh, I would like to extend my sincere congratulations for the IGE for the 20th anniversary, because as uh, one who came from Asia, uh, I know that how difficult it is to maintain all the uh, independent policy-oriented think tanks in Asian society. So. Uh, that's my greetings, and uh, uh, today I, I would like to uh, say something about the uh, uh, Japanese economy under the uh, so-called Abenomics. And actually, uh, Japanese political and economic cycle is very different from the, probably from the rest of Asia, uh, probably because we had been sleeping 
uh, when the rest of the global economy were enjoying all the uh, growth and uh, uh, exciting time. So now we are ready to uh, fight back against the uh, old difficulties that we accumulated in the past. So uh, maybe I just uh, will be able to uh, start from the uh, recent performance. Um, uh, fortunately, the uh, Japanese economy is picking up, and uh, we are, according to the IMF, the uh, GDP growth rate for Japan is expected to be something like 2%, but uh, we've been outperforming the uh, prospects so far, and it is prob most probably we, uh, grow, we will expect it to grow nearly 3% or somewhere. Uh, this year. Uh, now in a Japanese economy is full of engine uh, with a, a gigantic uh, uh, monetary easing policy plus uh, dynamic uh, fiscal spending policies uh, plus uh, growth strategies. So the, uh, uh, the blue line shows the, uh, the uh, uh, actually um, the Second quarter of 2013 this year, uh, the only minus negative part is uh, private inventory, but the rest, like uh, uh, private capital investment, household sector, as well as export, has all picked up in, in, into the positive, uh, positive growth. So uh, the uh, second quarter's is annual basis is almost ne getting nearly 4% of growth, which is very much outstanding as the uh, Japanese uh, performance in the past. And uh, the reasons why the uh, private inventory was inv inv inventory investment was shrunk was that some, since the consumption is very much strong, uh, some companies are suffering from the uh, lack of uh, inventory. So that so the, uh, we are shaping uh, relatively better than far better than before. So that's the early success, but we don't know uh, how sustainable it is. Um, um, so the uh, so-called abenomics consist of, as is well known, as a three arrows. One is uh, monetary easing, uh, inflation, massive inflation targeting, plus uh, massive uh, monetary easing, QQE. And the second arrow is a fiscal stimulus that is very much concentrated on the uh, first and second quarters of this year. And we finally decided to raise the uh, uh, value-added tax to 8% uh, next year, which is uh, negative, of course, the pressure for the growth, but still that is very much necessary for the uh, uh, very bad uh, fiscal positions in a, in a Japanese government. And uh, arrow three is uh, cross policy, and of course we need uh, only the uh, serious reforms and deregulations in the uh, targeted sector. So. Uh, through the uh, three combinations of arrows, we are desperately now trying to jump from the uh, deflationary trap to the uh, normal equilibrium, uh, unlike before. So uh, the, there is a absolutely a political logic, different logic from the democratic parties of Japan's time uh, that lasted for three years after the collapse of the uh, 55 years of Liberal Democratic Party. And uh, at the beginning, DPJ was trying to do everything uh, but uh, LDP. And their logic is like this. Well, the government is, should support the uh, household sector intensively through the uh, house uh, uh, child care raising uh, support or uh, other uh, subsidies. And then probably household will be able to spend more and then corporate will, will enjoy the benefit. But this never worked and we all suffered. And also they are totally lacking in uh, macro policies. And the, uh, as is well known, so, uh, Bank of Japan was somewhat reluctant in taking in the uh, inflation targeting policies, although many economists supported the ideas even during the three years of rains. And then uh, ADP came with the uh, uh, second uh, PM Abe's uh, time and then the uh, logic has just uh, make a big turn. So now what what the Japan is trying to do is the government is is desperately do something to stimulate the uh, uh, corporate sector uh, investment 
through the deregulation, through the uh, free trade agreement, through the outside pressure or whatever. And then probably corporate sectors uh, will enhance their productivities and they, they can, they'll be able to commit more for their job and the uh, pro productivities and that sort of uh, logic. And that's a very different logic. So the first one uh, uh, arrow uh, hit at the target. Well, hopefully, uh, in the right way. So, uh, deflations, well, we've been very much suffering from the so-called deflationary spiral since the end of 1990s, but, uh, okay, uh, but we are getting out of it, hopefully. And the second arrow is a fiscal stimulus pact, but uh, uh, many people criticize the uh, Japanese uh, sticking to the uh, public works that is uh, full of vested interest. But the, uh, there is uh, some transparency after the very cruel Koizumi reforms uh, in the f five years. And then there's uh, some uh, logic for the resilience after the big earthquake. So uh, the public works has changed a little bit. And the arrow th three is the growth policies. And uh, uh, arrow three is just, just actually this, there's nothing new. We've committed to this kind of reforms for 20 decades, but it's, the serious uh, impact never uh, was rea realized. So uh, the, the list of the whole long uh, homework is just there, private sector dynamics, of course. We need uh, uh, zombie firms to get out of the market. Uh, and also, uh, what's very much popular, got so popular about Abenomics in the world is he's supporting the uh, more labor participations of women. Finally. And, uh, but actually it's not women, but it's more the elderly. It's the uh, jobless young people who's expected to work more positively, uh, in the labor sectors. And that's why we need to be more serious about the, uh, labor flexibility, uh, lab mobility, labor mobilities and the labor market flexibilities. And we have energy sectors because all the atomic energy power generations stopped in Japan. So we've got to do, seek for something new. And of course, we have to reform the agriculture sector because we are trying to join the TPP. And uh, what's TPP is different from the other uh, Japanese low levels of EPA or FDA so far, so far is that it will expect it to create a huge uh, price mechanism or price pressure for the uh, uh, targeted agricultural sector. So we've been saying that, oh, we need an agricultural sector reform because the farmers are uh, all getting old and we are losing the productivities, but it's all the uh, political uh, campaign, but it's, but was lacking in the uh, price mechanism. So, uh, that's a very different thing, uh, from the past. So, since the time is, um, so the uh, next, uh, new frontiers is, uh, uh, special economic zones to realize those kind of reforms, uh, which may be able to politically a little bit easier. And also, uh, we are, uh, we should be very desperate in, uh, enhancing the location competitiveness, including the uh, corporate tax, tax cut, etc. And the, uh, uh, of course, we are to welcome the uh, inbound FDI because inbound FDI stock in Japan is even smaller than North Korea. So we have to be serious about these issues. So uh, the thing that we are trying to do is to put everything, every pact in, in, uh, in the uh, uh, negotiations with the TPP. And uh, Japan has a long tradition of outside pressure. So if you find it something difficult to do with your own visit interest, say uh, we are sometimes say that, uh, oh, there's outside pressure, so uh, there's a gaiatsu, so we have to do it. So that sort of uh, t uh, is uh, outside pressures is the most thing that is ex expected about the uh, high level FTA like P TPP. So that's why we'd be more interested in plurilateral and comprehensive agreement. And that is very much uh, the interest for, from Jap Japanese point of view, because during the whole yen appreciated period, Japan FDI has just scattered around in the uh, whole Asia as well as the rest of uh, the other countries. So uh, we, it should be far better not to go, not to approach bilateral basis, but more for the plurilateral basis. So, uh, and of course, we have to be more serious about uh, FDI environment, including uh, investor state uh, dispute settlement, etc. So, uh, that's why we've got interest in TPP. So, we are actually the only nations uh, which 
uh, have started to negotiate both the TPP and RCEP, and uh, we have Japan EU FTA, and also Japan Korea China Pact is also there. So it's a big uh, pressure for the uh, whole reforms. So, so far, we've been somewhat successful, but of course, there's a lot of skepticism. And as, uh, uh, the first one is, of course, the fiscal sustainability. Uh, so, uh, many people still worry that the, uh, uh, the decisions to raise up the value added tax may, uh, break the, uh, the up upward mood, upward trend, uh, like the experience of 1997, but uh, as so far we judge the uh, fiscal cons consolidations is more important uh, for Japan than just just the growth rate, uh, unlike, the, uh, unlike the past. And uh, there's another uh, criticism saying that, oh, LDP guys is trying to um, go back to their public works again. But uh, fortunately, as I said, Koizumi destroyed almost everything. So uh, new LDP was somewhat benefited by the uh, reform in the past. So, but still, uh, there are many issues, and uh, especially the cutting of social security uh, issues is, uh, uh, of course, the main issue for our fiscal sustainability. And uh, it's totally opposite uh, from, from Korea, trying to give something, we are already too much given, and they, the government is trying to cut out, and it's a huge political debate, especially the demographic structures is very much aging. And uh, uh, the second uh, skepticism is over the uh, uh, growth policy. Oh, agriculture, healthcare, uh, constructions, SMEs, labor markets, uh, these are all targeted areas, are all full of vested interest. So, uh, and also the vested interest is very, organized and protected by the uh, uh, huge bureaucracies too. So uh, uh, we have to uh, tackle with the outside pressure as well as the uh, newly in uh, innovative uh, ideas. And finally, um, but the final uh, skepticism is the uh, political distractions. Uh, in terms of this, I think uh, Japanese situations right now is something positive because uh, virtually anti, uh, opposition parties just re remained as a communist party. So the, uh, the support for the, uh, LDPs and the, uh, ruling parties is very strong right now. And there's, there won't be no elections, uh, for the next year. So that means unless Japan turns to be the communist, probably <laughs> this reforms is expected to continue. And it's, uh, what's more worrying about is the exuberance even for the uh, decision making politics. So finally we can decide something, let's do it. And it's a sort of exuberance sometimes can be very uh, naive about the uh, diplomacies with the uh, neighboring countries, and that's one of the uh, emerging uh, worrying. But the, uh, so temporary, my conclusion is, well, Japan is going to fight the uh, models flu this year, and it will continue uh, until next year. And uh, so far, Abenomics is doing fine, and Arrow 1 was right in the target. Arrow 2 works fine in the short run. Uh, we don't know about the sustainability, but still, uh, there is a strong support for the uh, anti-earthquake kind of project, and uh, uh, the environment is very different right now. So the focus will shift into the arrow three. Uh, so the long list is nothing new. So oh, Japan's homework is just to do it. And the, uh, in that terms, the uh, macro, positive macro environment is very positive uh, right now, even including the uh, positive uh, negotiations in the TPP. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. We are running out of time. It is almost uh, one o'clock. Uh, as a moderator, uh, I'd like to ask the, this is one question on the German economy in terms of uh, international competitiveness. Uh, in the early 1990s, uh, the Germans and Japanese uh, world market export share is about the same, around 11% or 10% of the world market share. Now, uh, uh, Japan dropped to about 5%, but Ger Germany uh, still maintained around 9 to 10% despite the entrance of the uh, emerging uh, economies, including the China. So I'd like to list, uh, ha have you, uh, I'd like to ask your uh, opinion to be shared with our audience. 
uh, what are the factors behind um, the uh, Germans' uh, international competitiveness? Okay, this is a very difficult uh, question to answer. Um, I believe uh, one thing that uh, Germany has grasped well at a grassroots level is how to combine very strong manufacturing performance with related services. So Germany does not only export manufacturing goods, it exports along with these goods a lot of services uh, for upkeep, product development, and so on. And that is what um, prevents Germany from being easily displaced uh, in the export market. The other thing about Germany to remember is that 10 years ago it was vying with Italy for a position as sick man of Europe. Meanwhile, it's become the engine of Europe. And uh, one question that one needs to ask is, uh, what are the reasons for this transformation? And, uh, many policymakers in Germany tend to be uh, perhaps too self-congratulatory. They say that uh, Schröder's reforms, the Agenda 2010, the Hartz reforms of the labor market, completely transformed the competitiveness of the German economy. If one looks at this uh, on a more micro level, which uh, my institute and many others um, have done, it turns out that these reforms only tell a rather small poor part of the story. And a much larger part of the story seems to be told um, uh, by macroeconomic developments. Um, that over many years, a period of 15 years, one could say, Germany invested very heavily in high unemployment. Unemployment just ratcheted up um, for a period of at least one and a half decades. And that scared the unions. And as a result, uh, in the new millennium, uh, Germany had uh, six, seven years in which wages grew more moderately than productivity. And that uh, helped the economy uh, enormously. And this party is over. The wages are no longer growing more slowly than productivity. And therefore, Germany will need to consider doing the homework that remains, which means more labor market reform, pension reform, health reform, education and training reform. Um, and as well, to consider um, being a good influence uh, in the Eurozone area, that is actually proposing uh, solutions that will be a benefit to both creditor and debtor countries in Europe. Germany is in a unique position to do that, and at present it's perceived too much in terms of simply protecting its own interests representing creditor countries vis-a-vis -vis debtor countries. It's in a position to do both. And it could do both by promoting financial market uh, reform and by uh, help promoting um, better underpinnings for fiscal rules and fiscal sustainability in the European area. Thank you very much. Due to time constraint, uh, the session will now come to uh, close. Uh, I'm very sorry the audience can interact with the, the speakers uh, during the lunch time and the coffee break. Thank you very much for excellent uh, presentation. Thank you.